We're getting into the meat of metamorphism now, and today's lecture, I'd like to do it a one-off lecture on kinematic textures. Oh my gosh, got to get the spelling right today. Kinematic, that's the blue ink, is messing me up. Now, we're actually not going to talk too much today. Uh, instead, we're going to do a lot of we're going to do a lot of just drawings of these different textures. Then the text we have pages four eleven to four twenty two, four forty seven to four fifty five, and then also five forty six to five fifty five. A lot of different, probably great images in that portion of the textbook. And what is going to happen with these kinematic textures is that we get this these anisotropic minerals responding to the stresses. And they respond in a bunch of different ways. And those are the textures we need to learn to recognize in metamorphic rocks. Now, one word that I know I've already introduced to you is the word foliation. And we define that as an alignment of non-equant minerals. In fact, let's just call it platy minerals because lineation is when they're more rod-like, right? Well, there's actually a lot of different types of foliations, and we're going to go through those right now. The first type of foliation that occurs in the lowest type of metamorphism is called slaty cleavage. As that foliation gets to higher and higher grades, slaty cleavage turns into a phyllitic cleavage, hence the name phyllite as the rock that has that texture. And then once that develops to higher grade, you create a new type of foliation called schistosity. And if we were to draw each of these and look at them maybe under a microscope or in hand lens, slaty cleavage, the micas, are super small that have started to form. They're aligned all together, but they're really tiny. And you can probably only see that under the microscope. The rock's gonna look very dull. But as these minerals grow in response to increasing metamorphic grade, you'll eventually get to a phyllitic cleavage, which is bigger, micas are aligned. Now all of these are defined by micas, by the way, the biotites and the muscovite. Still in response to compression, but it's gonna produce a rock that even with your naked eye, is going to have a decent sheen to it because the light reflects off the phyllitic cleavage. As we go towards higher metamorphic grade, the micas continue to grow until they're big and shiny. You can see them. You don't need a microscope anymore. You can see it with the naked eye. And this is called, well, maybe this isn't a technical term, but the rock starts to look really spangly and shiny to your eye. This is the development of foliation. One type of foliation that you can see with a slaty cleavage, let me show you an example of this, Just from the, like, and this will be a slaty cleavage example. Let's say you have a rock, it's a shale, and in fact it hasn't been metamorphosed very strongly, and you can still see a relict sedimentary bedding. But the rock has been compressed by metamorphism, and the micas start to align like so. And you'll actually see these bands cross-cutting the relic bedding that formed in response to pressures, tectonic pressures, aimed in this direction. This would be a place where the slaty cleavage is cross-cutting the relic bedding. The micas end up aligning and making the rock weak, which is why you can use um, that weakness to make slate as a building stone. Now when you take that um, cleavage and you actually start to fold it by increased metamorphism, it's called a crenulation. So a crenulation is an additional texture. It has to do with cleavage, but it's when you have a folded cleavage. And then that folding actually starts to produce a secondary alignment. Okay, and we'll actually put that secondary alignment. What does that look like? Well, here's like the best, here's my best try at it. Let's say you have a cleavage that's starting to get folded, right? And here it is. And we'll put a couple layers together. And the folding's starting to get really pronounced, right? You can see that there's two different textures in this rock. There's the folded cleavage texture, but then there's also a texture defined here, right? Here, 
and through here. And it's those that are the crenulation. It tends to look like a wrinkled skin if you see it in hand sample. Maybe like an elephant skin they talk about it as sometimes. A wrinkled skin on the surface of the rock. All right, the next type of foliation is a compositional layering. We're heading towards the idea of nisic banding. So a compositional layering. This is defined by bands of different minerals. Defined by bands of different mineralogy. And most of the time, there are bands that are felsic. All right, so these bands, what are they? There tends to be felsic, light colored bands, and there tends to be mafic, darker colored bands. We can have compositional layer in a couple different types of rock. In fact, let's go with the one that is probably the less common, and that's in a schist. You can, in a schist, oftentimes not seen in hand, not seen in the hand, with a hand lens or with a microscope, you'll get mica layers and quartz rich layers. This is very common to see. There's no real name for this, just besides compositional layering, where, let's see, you get, here's, let's do a folded schistosity. And here's another layer of the micas. And in between them is a layer of primarily quartz. The two most important minerals in a schist are mica and quartz. Of course, there can be all sorts of other fascinating minerals like garnet and kyanite and tourmaline, but it's really the micas and the quartz that define that rock type. All right, that would be a fine drawing for you to show compositional layering in a schist with the mica layers shown by the dashes and the quartzes shown by the circles. Of course, and you should always make your drawings more beautiful than mine. Nisic banding is the most famous of the compositional layers. This is the separation of felsic and mafic minerals in high-grade metamorphic rocks. Separation of felsic and mafic minerals in high-grade, all right, that's kind of important, high-grade rocks. The felsic minerals that we care about here, these are going to be quartzes and feldspars primarily. And the mafic minerals that define the darker bands, these are our amphiboles and our pyroxenes and maybe our biotites. What does this look like? Well, we can draw, draw a rock. Here we'll draw a rock. And of course, you can look this up in your textbook or on Wikipedia. I'm sure there's great, and, and we can create layers that are dark. We'll draw a few of them cutting through this rock. There we go, and just kind of shade that in and darken it up. And it's just, that's what it is, layers of light and layers of dark. They tend to be on the scale of centimeter spacing. Sometimes there are large outsized porphyroblasts in the felsic or mafic layers. And when we have these felsic elongated, um, sorry, when we have these elongated, ah, what am I trying to say here? Porphyroblasts. Let's just put a definition here. Let me read it straight off the notes for you. These are lenticular porphyroblasts, porphyroblasts. They have the name Augen, which stands for I, I believe, in German. This is something to look for when you look at Nisic textures. So moving on to away from foliations to the last main heading of today's lecture, and these are going to be more textures that we can see in the porphyroblasts, right? And porphyroblasts are the outsized larger crystals. We're going to call this kinematic porphyroblast. Porphyroblasts. They give us an opportunity to look into the relative timing of crystallization. There are things that happen um, before main deformation called pre-kinematic, after post-kinematic, and during synkinematic. And that's what we need to go through now. So we're going to say that these provide an indication 
of timing. The first main type is called prekinematic. Prekinematic crystals exist prior to deformation. Prior to deformation. And as such, they are bent, they are broken. All that deformation is imposed upon the crystal lattice. We might say fractured, there should be in thin section, we should see things like undulatory, extinction. These are all different textures that we would expect to see in a pre-kinematic texture that has been deformed. If we were to draw, here's like a garnet porphyroblast, we might see like a bunch of fractures pervading through the pervading through the crystal lattice. Or let's say a biotite, maybe it's it got some kink bands in it because it was there and it started to get bent apart by deformation. If we were looking at thin section for undulatory extinction, oh, this is going to be harder for me to draw, but you could try to draw a crystal that shows undulatory extinction in thin section. The other end member is post-kinematic. These are undeformed crystals that occurred after the deformation. So let's call let's define this as strain free crystals that cross cut fabric. Right? They grew after all the main action. What would this look like? Well, they tend to be big beautiful crystals that don't show any evidence for deformation, like these two examples. And then here's, let's put in a metamorphic foliation fabric. And notice that the crystals don't align to that fabric at, at all. They are post-kinematic crystals. Sometimes you'll get a, like a really, it'll even, it'll even be more photogenic than that, where maybe the metamorphic fabric is highly bent and folded, and then you could get like this crystal that just, grows right across all of it and shows no evidence for caring that the fabric was ever even there. That's our post-kinematic environment. Now, of course, most crystals don't grow in either of those environments. Most metamorphic minerals grow synkinematically. Synkinematic crystals. We'll say that they grow synchronously with deformation. Synchronously with deformation. And this is the norm, not the exception. Most crystals are growing during definition or deformation. What they do is they provide a sense of shear. Provide a sense of shear. Right? They are the clues that are going to allow us to understand the directions of all the different stresses. They do that in a number of different ways. They can produce a foliation. Okay, we've talked about that. They can produce a lineation. Okay, we've talked about that as well already. And with a foliation and lineation, these are, can be associated with folding. All right? That's all I'm talking about, right? That is, no doubt, synkinematic crystallization of biotite responding to our compressional stress. Now let's go into some new things. Well, how about this term augen? Sometimes these augen have tails to them. What does that mean? Well, you can have a crystal, let's say here's a big crystal of garnet, and it'll actually have these mineral tails that extend off from it like this, and like this. And if you see that, then you can read that the sense of shear was like this. And we'd call that a right lateral sense of shear. That would be an exciting texture to see in a rock. Of course, you can also have cracked crystals. Maybe those cracks will align with a sense of shear. 
Mica fish is another interesting example. Mica fish kind of look like augin with tails, but what ends up happening is that the deformation will create an open space, and mica crystals, like biotite or muscovite, will form within that open space that's formed. So let's say this, here's what a mica fish looks like. And it's a, again, this is a right lateral environment where we're opening, opening space fills with micas. We could, uh, how do we fill that space with micas? We could like put some mica crystals like that across it. And this should come down tight and sharp. There you go, that's a mica fish. And maybe the most complicated of all are snowball crystals. And we get snowball garnets quite commonly. So we'll put down snowball garnets and we'll make a drawing of it. But what a snowball garnet does is that there's a trail of inclusions within the crystal. Let's say, let's define it before we, so trail of crystals within, oh, let's say, let's say crystal inclusions within the main porphyroblast. Porphyroblast. What does this look like? Well, we get a garnet crystal there's a nice, beautiful garnet crystal, but inside that garnet crystal, we get trails of inclusions that like spiral inwards towards the inside. And it tells us that this garnet has been rotating like this in response to deformation. And the crystal has grown from a small garnet to a bigger garnet and wrapped in probably the texture that was surrounding it. Okay, we could draw in some foliated micas like this. That's something I hope you see when you go look at the textbook for this material. Oh, now I realize I might have forgotten one really important texture that we see in metamorphic rocks. Let's scroll back up to see where the best place is to fit it in. Let's put it underneath Nisic banding or compositional layering. What will sometimes happen is that one of the layers will get extended and break apart. So I'm gonna put a little C over here and we're gonna call this boudinage. B-O-U-dinage. With boudinage, and it, it's, it's an extensional breaking of a more rigid layer. Rigid layer. Typically, that is the more felsic layer. And what does it look like? Well, boudinage has to do with some European language. That means sausage. And so we'll get this extension that'll take a layer that used to be together, but as it's pulled apart, that layer breaks apart and forms these boudins. And then the surrounding foliated material will kind of wrap into those layer, into the open spaces that are provided. This is a fairly common texture to see in Nices. All right, it's boudinage, and it shows the extensional direction. All right, well, that's it for kinematic textures. Thanks for playing along.